rather less than complimentary about me. Indeed, if I might say so, I thought him rather confrontational. Indeed, strident in his tone. Indeed, strident in his tone, mood, and style. And the House will not expect me to complain about that. In fact, I gave him some good marks for his combative style, but I gave him none for content. With regard to the latter point, with Order. the point, when the Honourable Gentleman was a member of the Labour Party, and the Labour Party governed Britain without a majority in England, he didn't complain then, and neither did we, because we believe in the United Kingdom. I recognise he doesn't. With regard to his comments on the Education Scotland Bill, of course he doesn't want to extend choice to ordinary people. He's a socialist. That's why he doesn't. And it's that kind of sourness which has made them a party which has given up hope. There's no hope that British industry can ever compete, so they take cover behind import controls. We believe British industry can compete, and so we're going to give it the opportunity. They've no hope and no determination to achieve multilateral disarmament, disarmament on all sides. So they go in for one-sided abandonment of our deterrent while they leave nuclear weapons in the hands of our sworn enemies. They've no hope that Britain can make her way in Europe, so they want to pull out of the common market. They've no hope of real jobs for our people, so they go in for false jobs, whatever the cost. Labour has no hope for Britain, and it offers no hope to Britain. They've no faith in the British people. Mr. Speaker, I listened very carefully to what the Right Honourable Gentleman said uh, during his speech. He seemed very long on words, he seemed very short on content, and I began to understand why he lost the general election in such a decisive way. Because to Labour's fury, millions of people have bought shares in privatised industries, like British Telecom. Like British Telecom, British Airways, British Gas, and in TSB, and there's more to come. Yeah. He also seemed to address so many of his remarks to some of the shibboleths of the 30s. Those have absolutely no appeal whatsoever to the population of our country, which is becoming home owning, share owning, and savings owning, and having an independence. They would never have thought. Those class shibboleths have no relevance at all to our modern society. People know full well they have a higher standard of living than they've ever had before, that that comes from cooperation between a government which, together with partnership of the people, has brought about economic strength and standards of health care and social security we have never had before. Repeat, never had before, before I give way. As one of his professors recalled of his essays as a student, Mr. Speaker, he could always turn in ten pages about nothing, but he did not find it easy to write two pages about anything. <laughs> the Right Honourable Gentleman has given very much... gentleman has given his usual speech. He totally overlooks, he totally overlooks the economic resurgence that we have brought about in the last 12 years. Indeed, one wonders what country he has been living in. Until 1979, we were in the corporate state era. It was an era of relative economic decline and social disintegration. We enter the 1990s 
with the supply side of the British economy in incomparably better shape than at any... comparably better shape than at any time in our history. Those are not my words. They are the words of the CBI's Director General. Mr. Speaker, as the Honourable Gentleman is aware, education in Scotland is rather different from education in England and there is reference in the gracious speech there is reference in the gracious speech to a particular bill to deal with education in Scotland, as the Honourable Gentleman is aware. Because the Honourable Gentleman is saying that because there are more Labour members in Scotland than Conservative, we cannot in fact legislate there, then I must point out to him many past Labour governments had no right to legislate whatsoever for England, and that will not be legislation to be absolutely not legal. That is absurd. We are the United Kingdom, and I hope we shall stay the United Kingdom. Mr. President, Labour's banner reads back, back to a high-tax society, back to the old days of inflation by social contract, back to rule by Congress House when the Labour Party was a wholly owned subsidiary of the unions. The Labour Party, Mr. President, is two different factions in a state of civil war with the left steadily gaining ground.